pièce est conseillée pour les défis sociétaux à la Commission européenne. Euh, donc je vais lui poser les questions en anglais. Vous allez excuser d'avance mon accent. Je n'ai pas pu beaucoup pratiquer sur le terrain ces derniers temps, malgré évidemment un été apprenant comme il se doit. Euh, hello, Ilias. So you hear me loud and clear? Yes. Okay. Bonjour à tous. <laughs> so we're really glad, of course, uh, to be able to speak uh, with you uh, today. So the European Commission has unveiled its green ambitions in December through the European Green Deal, published its digital and data strategy last February, and circular economy action plan in March. As you were one of the contributors of these strategies, could you share with us what is the role of digital in the green transition? What is the big picture when it comes to the interplay of green and digital? And of course, what are the planned EU actions? <coughs> Thank you. So good morning again. I don't know how is the English understanding of the whole audience, so I will try to be slow. Is there anybody that translates the same moment? I guess so. Yes, I think so. There yes. is a translation, so yes, there is. people can hear mm -hmm. that, so I'll try to be even slower then. So thank you for the opportunity. GS1, uh, it's actually, I was so fascinated by the previous speakers that I forgot to actually summarize my speech, but congratulations to the previous speakers. It was really interesting and I learned a lot. And I'll try to refer to that so it makes sense to the audience as well. So first of all, Europe has a big ambition. I don't think any other continent was so ambitious as the ones that we proposed in the Green Deal to be climate neutral by 2050. But the Green Deal doesn't only talk about climate neutrality in vacuum. It talks about biodiversity. So Christian knows what I'm talking about. It talks about energy transition. It talks about clean industry. It talks about mobility and talks about several other things. When we prepare the Green Deal, so the first message for the audience and maybe for the French uh, administration is that for the first time in the history that, and I'm already 27 years working on different policies in the commission, for the first time, all the minist ministers, which is general directorates and commissioners had to work together. And they said, this changes my mandate, this changes my work. So we have 20 something general directorates, each of them has a portfolio. They, all the general directors were around the table saying, this changes my work. So everybody understood. And that's the first time I have seen all the general directors talking about the same thing. Normally it's clusters four or five together. So this was one thing, Green Deal, that brought everybody together and understood the interdependencies. Because when we do something in Industrial policy, it has effect on biodiversity, it has effect on chemical sustainability, it has an effect on digital and other things. So this is the first message. It's the first time that Green Deal make everybody to talk uh, the same language. Second is that they forgot completely in the beginning the digital. So when the Green Deal was discussed as the first with Timmermans and he got the mandate how to do it, there was not a single reference to digital. So I created kind of a, what I call my task force of uh, digital for planet musketeers. So I have connections in all the DGs and we created a movement in a way internally saying digital cannot be left out from the green when politics are discussed on green because it can undo all the good things if it's not managed well. So uh, the message finally got uh, the last moment before the Green Deal is published, it was understood, so there is a reference. But it was left for Thierry Breton to express exactly what digital can do in the digital policy in February. I will display later on what exactly we said we will do, but what I want to say is the following. Green and digital have big symbiosis. Green cannot happen without proper use of digital. But if digital is not green jacketed, if it's not managed, it can undo all the good things. It can actually make it worse. So this is really strong relationship that we need to manage. And that's the second message. And just to imagine, just to kind of give you the uh, idea, can I display in a slide number one? I have sent a couple okay, slides. Slide number one. So it's okay. It works. So if you want to understand the role of digital, let's look at the Sustainable Development Goal, SDGs, okay? I don't know what the acronym is in French, but uh, 
there are 17 SDGs that the United Nations put as our sustainability goals. Digital, which, you know, there is a method that Gezi, uh, there is a link that you can see and follow if you want. There was an analysis done that digital can actually help 11 of the 17. There is a clear positive link, clear positive relationship. And, and I have two examples of them there. It's, it's obvious in a way. And I worked uh, for more than 25 years in e-health and digital health. And so it, it can be done. There are about five SDGs where it's not clear. It's either or, you know, it's, it's confusing, it's unclear. It has a lot of positives, a lot of negatives. And one of them is climate, life on earth, life on the sea. So everything that is environmental, it's not yet proven. It's unclear, but the potential is there. And one that is negative and that I will drill on during the speech is actually the responsible consumption and production. And this is something that you will also discuss in the panel, because I know there are panelists that know this very well. Our consumption society is really bad. Mm -hmm. The people are fascinated by the energy consumption of, uh, of digital, but it's uh, that for me, that's a list of a problem because the energy efficiency of the new chips that we will get and renewables that we will throw because they are very rich companies, the ICT, they will buy the renewables, they will even create their own solar parks and, and, and wind, windmills. The problem is the material inefficiency. And just to give you one understanding, we change our mobile phones every two years, on average in Europe. Mobile phone, 80% of the emission is to produce a mobile phone, 20% is to use it. But in that mobile phone, there is a 10% of gold, rare metals. There is not enough of them if we continue like that. The earth has a limit. Plus, if everybody could keep mobile phone one more year, so if you could keep mobile phone, just let's say change it every three years instead of two or every four years instead of three, it corresponds to one million cars less, or if you do that by 2030, so in the next 10 years, it corresponds to million cars less on our streets in Europe. So it's really powerful and just very small thing, just change your mobile one year later. So this is really important as a message that material inefficiency of digital is more important than the energy that it consumes. So on the power of digital that has been understood. So in, let's display the slide too, please. In February this year, we published what we can do using digital with respect to Green Deal. And basically you can think about it in, in, two, in, in two axes. We will try to make sure that at the data center and the, the damage done by the electricity consumption is minimized. So we said all our data centers have to be in Europe by 2030 climate neutral. We just hope that they will not be exported as the previous speaker said. It's not about exporting the data el elsewhere because data and the data sovereignty is TRE's biggest challenge. So we will just make sure that we have the technologies of lower chip, better management and renewables that will feed our data because we want data and we want data to stay in Europe and we want actually more data to be collected in Europe. Second thing is the material inefficiency. So we will, what we will do, we will try to make the mobile phones be built and designed for longer use. We will make law that they have to be software has to be updatable. So people don't throw away laptops, iPads, mobiles, consumer electronics, just because the software doesn't work anymore. Or because one company decides that the WhatsApp or whatever you're using as an application is not anymore updatable on your device. We will also make sure that there is a reparability and that there is a recyclability because it's very low in electronics. In electronics, it's very low percentage is recycled. It's a refurbished, maybe sent for second use, but not really recycled. So that's the second part. One, and that's most important for your audience today, we actually built something, it's a concept of a data space. We said there is a lot of data about environment. There's a lot of data about uh, industry, industrial data, a lot of data about uh, mobility or energy, but it's not connected. We create a data space, we will try to put some legislative 
boundaries how the public administrations should share and interconnect and put basic interoperability so that there is also use between different sectors so the health data environment data they have a lot in common what is there about health that doesn't have to do with environment if you think of your healthcare healthcare is part of three things it's your genetic it's what i call nature it's how good the health system is but most importantly it's the environment it's the nurture is the environmental aspect that determines your health status at every moment. So that data has to circulate and has to be accessible according to certain laws, security, accessibility, and all that, of course. So data spaces and the green data space and circular economy data space may be of most of your interest as audience, and we can drill that in separate discussions. And for that, uh, I invite every audience that will find something interesting to bother basically uh, Francois or Francesca in the Brussels office to get in contact with us how to engage with the Commission with the Commission programs because we will put a lot of research innovation deployment and recovery money so we have something called digital Europe program that will build the data spaces and for that I know for you Brussels is very far away and nobody understands this <laughs> that's why I said just get in touch with me we can translate we can see exactly how you as a company how you as a research institution how you as the ngo or association can get in touch and and profit from these european uh, programs so there is a recovery so we have decided and in the summit in july 750 billion will go on recovery post-covid recovery it's twinned digital and green recovery the immediate thing that member states jumped and said yes we want this is energy efficiency of our buildings to be improved but when we do energy efficiency we have to also do digital upgrades of the buildings especially because it is good for 15 to 20 percent of the energy efficiency of the building is because it's smart building but more than that now we know how important it is to be able to telework to teleeducation to telehealth how many people couldn't go to hospital because of the COVID chronic disease patients that we could take care of much better if the house or buildings were smarter. So this type of recovery plans, and there is a recovery plan for agriculture and a recovery plan for clean industries. There is a recovery plan that deals with data and circular economy. And for that, no time to go into that. But as I said, make sure if I have, if you forget everything else, Remember, there is a way to contact us to understand what Europe can do for you. And is it through me directly? My email maybe can be dis uh, disseminated to the audience or through Francois and, and Francesca. Okay. And the third part on the slide is basically, uh, which is already gone, I think. Frederick took the slide out. It's the circular economy. So if I had to say, if digital had one silver bullet, if you have to choose what do I do with digital if I can do only one thing, if you can do only one thing with digital, I would say the top, top priority is to make, to help digital to turn our society and our economy to circular economy. Circular economy is maybe the biggest pillar of fight to, of climate change. Think about, you want to solve a climate change, then don't think only just stopping carbon burning somewhere, just energy transition is not enough. It, Christian already said it very well. There must be complete change in the way we do business and the way we act as consumers. And that's kind of the hidden part that nobody wants to touch, but this is the most important part. Can we as consumers change our behavior and be, you know, applies a sobriety in a way. So circular economy action plan is something that I personally pay a lot of attention and I work on something called digital circular economy action plan data space and product passport. So I would go to the next slide. There is a circular economy possibility as follows. Now, the two previous speakers know how agriculture works and they know that uh, there is something called precision agriculture and then that there is a lot of push to make agriculture more uh, you know, efficient by satellite images and GPS on the tractor, the, on the big fields, and there is a lot of sensor and this and that. So there is a movement to digitize agriculture. But for me, that's not enough and that's not good because many of the agricultural or um, 
agriculture uh, employees don't have the money to get digitized. Just digitizing industry and just digitizing for digitizing is not good enough. What I would like to actually point to is the last, last paragraph on this slide is, we need to use digitization to change the model of how we run our economy. Then is the power of digital really powerful. Otherwise, it's just another energy and another material on top of existing business processes and profits. We want to change from a quantity-driven profit to services and user needs that use less of a material. And dematerialization was very well explained with the previous speaker. So, Philippe, that was excellent and, and, and in deep. But if we just look at sector at a time and what we can really do at the moment, knowing how long it takes to change people's behaviors, what we could do in, just one example, what we could do in agriculture. Mm -hmm. Today, let's say buyer or any agricultural company makes money by selling quantity of fertilizer, quantity of pesticides. So the profit is to sell quantity, quantity of mobile phones, quantity of whatever and that will not go away very fast but in agriculture what we could think of is that buyer makes partnership becomes technology company or makes partnership with some big it company and they offer service to agriculture saying i will protect your health crop of uh, the health of a crop you pay me 100 euro per hectare whatever i'm just saying a price and we will guarantee that your crop will be taken care of and your soil will be taken care of now what happens? The company that provides the service will, be, will have the biggest interest to use as little pesticide, as, as little fertilizers, because it's a cost to them now. They will put as much as possible in terms of sensors, drones, as you see on the picture, satellite images, a lot of intelligence, a lot of data to monitor the health of that crop and make sure that they spend as least as little as possible of the agricultural product. Now, what do we have? I have a healthier soil, healthier plants, better food for the consumers, stable income for the industry, and uh, kind of stable expenses for the agricultural uh, sector. So this is just an idea, but that idea can be reproduced in any sector of economy. Instead of selling bulbs, we can sell light. Instead of selling cars, we can sell mobility. Instead of selling I don't know what you can imagine. You can always think about it product as a service. And that is one way to dematerialize. But of course, it requires consumers and sobriety. Otherwise, the rebound effect will be bring us back where we were and maybe worse, as it was explained in the example of a viral capitalism. And that is a really important point that uh, we should not forget, administration should not forget. Okay, yes. So what, what levers will be used for achieving this goal of circular economy? I guess data is not the only one. And how the Commission intends to promote the use of common standards? Right. The levers that we have, of course, it's to support... That there are several, okay? So Commission has three big guns. That's kind of a 101 for the audience, how to know us. Commission has legislative power. Okay, not in everything. So like in healthcare, in COVID, we saw how weak Commission is and European Union because member states did not give them any mandate on healthcare. So suddenly we were with our hands tied and said, oh, and as a result of COVID is that now we have a health program and we will get a mandate to be more active in the public health. So it, and we understood the weakness of, of Europe uh, in cases where there is not, member states did not give any powers to Commission. So what we will do is try to regulate. So European Green Deal, there'll be a lot of legislation. Legislation about how clean our industry should be, but of course we have to make sure that you know, it doesn't cre create expatriation of industries. It doesn't create inequalities because the combination of green and inequality can be very explosive. It, might, it can be much worse than gilets jaunes that we've seen in <laughs> France. Huh? So be, that is something that worries me the possibility of going fast for the green and going kind of, uh, you know, just being obsessed by green and not seeing that there is a social impact and that there is other impacts. Huh? So we have the regulatory aspects. We have the financing. 
and that's why the recovery is an opportunity to start and there was already somebody who said we will never be back to the same emissions but i'm afraid that if we don't structurally change these business models if we don't as a company you as a company if you don't change thinking of how many of these offices i do i really need how much travel do i need, really need to do how much of the supply chains can i uh, reconfigure you know if we don't do in the structural changes after the vaccine we will be back where we were and even worse so it's not so evident that we actually will change everything structurally immediately it still it will take some bold decisions and uh, and uh, big let's say big steps of uh, restructuring so we can fund we can fund innovation europe can fund deployment of innovation europe can fund municipality national regional and european projects so there's a lot of opportunities that i cannot go through all but the funding is important and you need to understand it how to benefit from that as a company as an ngo as research and the third thing is that we can bring people together we have a strong mechanism to come in as maybe a trusted party between countries and more importantly because if we really want to save the planet we need to work with industrial and international players and we can actually bring international setting so that this innovation and this opportunity of us going green will not penalize us because it'll cost a bit to transform but tomorrow when things really go in a panic mode we may have opportunity to show uh, the rest of the world to exp you know kind of sell our knowledge and and technologies and uh, know-hows so uh, now when it comes to greening we need to do it in consistent manners and because today if we want to go to circular economy we are suppose circular economy is the plane we would fly it blind we don't have the data to understand mm -hmm. where the product is produced which supply chain what happened on the way which consumer took it where did it go for repair where it was thrown away we are kind of running in in blind way so that's why i say we need international standards we need standards because we cannot destroy our internal market we cannot create product passports for france and other product passports for germany it has to be one for all europe if not the whole world because then we can monitor what's happening with the material flow with the product flow and with the waste and just to keep you one catchphrase if we have international if european and international standards monitoring the material and products we can really generate value from the waste waste is the value that lost its information yes. so it got decoupled if the waste has the information on it i am here this is what i am this is what it takes how much material i have in me and it can be a little electronic it can be a whole building you will see how secondary material use how you as a company can know exactly where is my product ending how much of that i can recuperate and bring back to manufacturing how much do i really need to import rare material from china or peru or wherever we take uh, things so there is much better way to do it if we have the data for it but i re i recall it has to be standardized and it has to be done in a way in an interoperable way because we cannot reproduce huge because we're talking about trillions of projects you, you can imagine the zettabytes of data every data has a co2 footprint we have to do it that there is a data once used many times accessible through blockchain to only those that can access it in secure way and blockchain actually can give you possibility to look into a data space and ask a question and get only answer to that question so you don't see everything you only see what you need to see so i have a last question uh Elias. uh what is the impact i, I told uh, i said the people that i wouldn't pronounce the name but i have to what is the impact of covid 19 <laughs> regarding the twin green and uh, digital transitions right i think that covid 19 uh, if you live in the digital, you know how much criticism you get for digital gap and all that. Uh, I just give you one figure in, in, Br in Brussels, in Belgium, 30% of people could keep their job because they could do things digitally from home. 30% did not lose their job and another 30% had only partial losses from job. So 
it actually saved us in a way as economy, although there will be a big dip in the GDP, which is a bad thing to measure anyway. Uh, digital, the power of digital became very clear. Plus we have uh, funded supercomputer things that kind of worked on finding vaccines. So digital got, uh, got looked at in a new eye. Huh? So people see it as a, with a different glasses a little bit, but at the same time, we have a lot of conspiracy theory about 5G and, and this and that. So uh, a lot of conspiracy theories and misinformation became so big that uh, people oh. worry that any rational way forward can be undermined by uh, by these uh, conspiracy theories. Now the green and digital uh, has the power now, it's better understood how it can twin together and how it can twin together, how it can help the circular economy, how it can help the agriculture, how it can help the mobility. So we as Europe understood that we have to get a better mandate and better clarification of what we can, of what we should do on international level when it comes to standardization, setting the laws, setting the laws and we're working on laws on biodiversity, chemical sustainability, zero pollution, um, and I'm working on all that with respect to data we have uh, on mobility, energy transition. So we do legislative acts that should be kind of common for all member states. So there is a common level playing field, but we also need data to support these policies, to monitor these policies. So this green and digital has now been understood and I'm driven to pieces by all the policies saying, now we need data. Now we understand what digital can do for us. So the digital, the role of the digital has been enhanced and the people understand that in order not to fly in blind, they really need the data for that. And I'm also worrying about the rebound effects and how to make it smart because the normal understanding of people in administrations is that I will ask for a database and I will ask all the administration to send me the regulatory data so I can check compliance directly to my central database. And we're saying, no, we need to create data spaces and with those data spaces to start uh, rolling circular economy and let the data spaces being used by business actors and business to consumer actors. So we don't centralize everything as public administrations. We enable digitally um, the circular economy to roll out. Okay, uh, thank you so much, Ilias. Uh, that was like a really clear, crystal clear, clear, I would say. Uh, and the message, um, well, I think we all understood that uh, you are available. Maybe I uh, will give your email address to everyone right now. <laughs> uh, thank you so much. I hope the weather is nice in uh, Brussels, by the way. No, it's okay. It was it's really okay. hot. <laughs> I mean, the climate change make the Brussels subtropical weather. I mean, in August <laughs> it was like 35. Uh, but, in Greece, it was cooler than in Brussels, but um, it's okay. Now, I just wanted to repeat a couple of things. How, do we have enough time or it's yes, over? Yes, you have, you have. Ah, okay. I just wanted to repeat that. Don't, I mean, there are many companies I understand and trade associations or NGOs and professors that don't be afraid to get in touch. It's not so complex as it feels. I, I know how it feels to people that are not do not understand how Brussels functions. So do not hesitate to contact. Uh, and I will try to give you the right people for the questions you have. There are programs that are kind of invisible to normal people. Uh, so there's always only few that know exactly how it works in Brussels. So get, I would offer that GS1 is actually the, you know, that Francois is the person that you bother and he will then know how to ask the question. Second is that we need to uh, get off this fascination about electricity usage by ICT because I think that will not be as big of a problem and really focus what we can do with the material inefficiency of digital okay but if I try to get in the shoes of the audience that are clients of GS1 or use GS1 is the data space and the product passport that can make your company much more competitive and better and you, you can actually try to get as a company greener, which now it really counts with respect to market, uh, what market looks at. Because you as a company in the past, we were giving too much emphasis on financial capital, 
a little bit on human capital, but no emphasis on natural capital. We need to rebalance that as a companies. We need to rebalance and say, look, for me, profit and growth, the sustainable kind of prosperity, let's call it, it's a mix of those three. It's not only financial. So when we talk to investors, they have to know what they really value on companies and in which companies they invest. Because I have a lot of pledges. I'm trying to create some kind of a green digital alliance. And companies say, well, I, have, I am green. I can do that. And I'm investing in solutions. But at the same time, they're giving solutions to big oil companies to drill where they couldn't drill otherwise with their clouds and uh, AI services. Mm -hmm. So investors have to look at that very carefully as well. So you as a company have to have a solid message, rebalance what it means to be growth and what's to be green as an organization and how to apply that knowledge to your supply chain and how to demand from your supply chain and how to clearly through a labels that we will actually mandate how the labels should be done green labels to communicate that to consumers. Thank you so much, Elias. Have a nice day. On peut l'applaudir, je pense. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, good luck. See you later.